You know, there's that saying, where were you when? Like, where were you when a major historic moment took place? Where were you when a major sports historic moment took place? Now, as far as the Knicks are concerned, unfortunately, there haven't been a lot of those where were you when moments. Obviously, last week was a major one. And it's the kind of moment where, you know, as long as you live, you're going to remember forever where you were, exactly what you were doing, and exactly what you felt when you first saw those, you know, nuggets of, of news, of information trickling in, that the Knicks and Porzingis' representation had a meeting, that the Knicks feel like he's not, or he wants to be traded, all the way to the point where you saw officially, and you didn't want to believe it at first, at first you kind of thought still, like, what is going on when you see breaking the Knicks and Dallas Mavericks have a deal in place to send Kristaps Porzingis to the Dallas Mavericks. I mean, you were shocked. And it's a feeling you will never forget. I will never forget where I was. I was at work, and, you know, I'm on Twitter, and I'm seeing those updates, and then my my WhatsApp starts going off, Twitter starts going off, and then eventually, you know, my, my only reaction was, how is this happening so quickly? Like, how did we you know, start up a hill and and, and all of a sudden we're sliding down this ice-covered, slippery slope to the point where Chris has Porzingis within a span of an hour and a half is no longer a Nick. So obviously that's one you're forever going to remember. But, you know, I would have to go back to 2004 when the Knicks traded for Marbury. And this is before, you know, you had WhatsApp, you had Twitter, and you know, I guess social media as we know it. So... I remember when that trade went down, my phone starts, I mean, I'm, I'm, people are calling me at work, and I, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, Joe, did you hear, the Knicks got Marbury, Knicks got Marbury, I'm getting emails, so it's like, Knicks, Marbury, oh my God, you know, that that's, it, obviously now, communication, the speed of information is, is way faster, but um, I would have to go back to 99 for another one of those moments where, you know, uh, the Knicks were playing the Miami Heat in the uh, first round playoff series, and Allen Houston hit that runner. And and, I, and it was one of those things where you remember exactly where you were. I was in college at Albany um, watching the game with a bunch of friends in a dorm room. And I just remember the whole residence quad because it was mostly freshmen and mostly from New York, you know, Long Island, New York City. The whole place went nuts. It was bonkers. It was like this impromptu celebration in the middle of the residence halls. It was nuts. But again, you know, you're calling your friends. You're, you're emailing your friends because you don't know how else to actually communicate with them. But... Um, you know, that brings us to Lynn Sanity because it was exactly, what was it, 2012, I'm like, I'm like struggling to figure out what year it is, 2019, seven years ago today was the official birth of Lynn Sanity. It was tonight that Jeremy Lynn came into the game for the Knicks against the then New Jersey Nets. It was back on February 4th. And if you remember, that was a Saturday night. If you're a Giants fan like myself, the next day was the Super Bowl. So I I remember all of our attention was on the Super Bowl, was on the Giants, was on this run they were having, the fact that they're going to go up against Brady and the Patriots for the second time in in five years. I mean, the Knicks at that time were kind of an afterthought. I mean, you look at their record heading into that New Jersey game, because, and the reason I say that is because after that game, they would go on to win six straight games. Heading into that game, it was loss, win, loss, win, loss, win, win, loss, loss. So obviously very up and down, up and down kind of a season for the Knicks. And a big reason for that, I mean, you remember, you know, that team, you know, they had a pretty good front court. I mean, I say pretty good, but, you know, Tyson Chandler, you know, defensive player of the year. You had Carmelo Anthony. You had Amari Stoudemire. Um you didn't have much in terms of the point guard position. Now, they had Iman Shumpert, who was drafted, known more as a shooting guard. They tried him at point guard. That obviously didn't work. They had Tony Douglas, who, you know, again, he was an okay player, but, uh, you know, had his moments where you thought to yourself, all right, Tony Douglas could be the next Charlie Ward. It didn't pan out. They even had Mike Bibby, you know, to try to bring some veteran presence to the point guard position, but that too didn't work out. Hence, that game, all right, if you remember back that, that night, the Knicks started off 
very slow against the Nets. And he, you saw Mike D'Antoni on the sideline. He had this look of frustration on his face. He kind of like angrily gestured to the bench. And that's when you see Jeremy Lin get up. Jeremy Lin gets up and the garden crowd is cheering. Like borderline standing ovation for Jeremy Lin coming into the game. That just goes to show you two things. One, that Knicks fans, you know, for what it's worth, it is a highly, highly educated fan base. They know exactly down to the nitty gritty what's going on and what exactly signifies that Jeremy Lin, you know, who at the time was like your your fourth guard off the bench, is coming into a game this early and what exactly, what kind of a message that's sending to the other guards. Um, and, and I'm going to take you, before we, you know, dive further into insanity, into that, that game, obviously, you know, against the New Jersey Nets, that was on February 4th. Back on January 28th, the Knicks were playing at Houston, a game they lost 97-84. Uh, to 84. That scoreline a lot closer, or rather unindicative of how much of a blowout that game was. Lynn came into the game, he played about 20 minutes, and he finished with 9 points and 6 assists. But if you remember, if you remember watching that game, you thought to yourself, you know, Lynn does something that the other guards either were not capable of doing or just weren't doing, and that is he had the ability to penetrate the paint. He had the ability to facilitate off the dribble, and it was just one of those things that you got to see it in, 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 in blowout minutes, but you thought to yourself, and I remember even the commentators, Alan Hahn was saying it in the post-game show because he was getting a lot of messages from Knicks fans, specifically about Lynn, and that was, you know, why isn't he getting, you know, regular playing minutes? Why, why isn't D'Antoni you know, reaching for that card and seeing what he has there. So, also keep in mind of the timeline that Jeremy Lin had. Jeremy Lin, that was essentially his last chance to prove anything because he was on a non-guaranteed contract with the Knicks. So, at any point after that game, they could have cut him. And so, essentially, it was Mike D'Antoni, you know, with a desperation plea, and then also figuring out, all right, look, hey, kid, here's your chance. Undrafted out of Harvard. See what we got. You know, let's see what we have. You know, show us what you got. And sure enough, that night, February 4th, I mean, it, it was incredible because he, you know, I, I remember specifically, I mean, you're watching the highlights here, showing that ability to penetrate, showing the ability to finish, you know, clinical passes in the paint. Um, you know, again, the Knicks that night, all of a sudden you figure, holy crap, they have a playmaker. I mean, they didn't have a playmaker at the point guard position that season. And all of a sudden you're seeing a playmaker from the most unexpected source. Now, also, if you remember, um, before that eventual call up, Jeremy Lin was playing in the D league. And I remember he was putting up like prodigious numbers. I remember one game in the D League, uh, he put up like a 39-point game, and he was called back up to the Knicks, but it was specifically said by the beat reporters that, you know, don't get too excited. This isn't because the Knicks think they have something in Jeremy Lin. This is more so because they, they just need, you know, an extra body, you know, for practice. They need another guard for practice. So, you know, you're, you're still not thinking to yourself that Lin is really going to get an opportunity to shine or really that he is going to amount to much, you know, but obviously that turned out to be false. Um, you know, the clinic that he was putting on against, you know, the Nets. And you remember, like, you know, some of those nice passes that he had to Tyson Chandler for the easy dunks, the emphatic dunks. And you're watching the Knicks bench just absolutely delirious. The Garden doesn't even know how to handle themselves, how to contain themselves. They're cheering at everything. I mean, it was a surreal atmosphere. It was one of those things that, you know, again, if you're watching the game, I remember I was watching the game, you know, meanwhile I'm on I'm on Facebook and, you know, I'm messaging friends and I'm like, yo, turn on the Knicks game, this, this is unbelievable. And all of a sudden you're seeing, you know, this unexpected Cinderella story in Jeremy Lin, you know, who would finish that night with 25 points, 7 assists. And I remember some of the end ones that he finished, one in particular where, you know, he, he splits between Darren Williams and another defender, splits them. Goes in for the layup, gets fouled, and, and the place just, I mean, the roof just caved. It was amazing. And you think back to that night, and obviously that, you know, gave birth to insanity and just that epic run, you know, 
which I guess would come to a halt against Miami on February 23rd. But but that night in particular against the Nets, it, it was unlike anything you've experienced as an as a Knicks fan, right? I mean, look, we we've experienced if if like I'm in my late 30s, I I experienced the Knicks run in the '94 Finals. Um, I experienced, and I remember pretty vividly their run, obviously in '99. Going to the finals uh, against San Antonio, and you know the the four point play, the Allen Houston runner. I mean, there were magical moments. Latrell Sprewell, you know, cueing a thirty two to two run against Indiana in one of those games. Um, you know, in the Eastern Conference Finals. I mean, there were magical moments in, in in that in that playoff run. But this was a magical moment, not in a playoff sen- playoff setting. And not for a team that really had any bold aspirations of, you know, doing anything in the playoffs, if they even would get to the playoffs. It was more so that you had a guy who was a complete Cinderella story, and all of a sudden the Cinderella story is taking place, you know, under the bright lights of Madison Square Garden. And, and we didn't know how to react. We didn't know how to respond because we were just blown away that, like, you know, this guy that we thought had some... Nominal talent is now putting on an absolute show against Darren Williams, one of the top point guards in the NBA and the New Jersey Nets. That he would then parlay into uh, a 28-point effort against Utah two days later. And then two days after that, a 23-point outing against Washington where he would have a slam dunk. And I remember there were so many jokes because I don't know if anyone actually at the NBA level ever really saw him throw it down and... He kind of had this lukewarm slam dunk, and you can see the the bench, everybody's laughing or whatever. But it, it was just one of those moments. You're just like, this is like this this Disney movie. This is writing itself. But then you know, I, I guess the other nominal, the 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 monumental rather moment in you know, insanity came six days after it was created, and that was against the Lakers. It was a Friday night game, um, and I I I, I remember. The garden was absolutely juiced for this one. It was Friday night, Lakers, and Jeremy Lin, I remember it was to the point where he's hitting step-back shots. He's driving the lane. I mean, faking defenders left and right. Finishing with 38 points, 7 assists in that game. It was unlike anything you've ever seen to the point where the whole crowd is just chanting, Jeremy, Jeremy. It was unreal. That was the night where you're saying to yourself, all right, this literally, we are now living a movie. And, you know, you think back to Linsanity, and obviously, like I said, February 23rd at Miami, that's sort of where, you know, the Miami Heat made it their game plan. We're going to stop this guy. If we have to rough him up, if we have to be excessive with him, we're going to stop this guy. Um, which they did. I mean, essentially, you know, that, that that was probably the low point of the Linsanity run. He only had eight points, um, six assists, whatever, three rebounds. But, you know, look, he, he would bounce back nicely. He had a, 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 a good number of 20-plus point games, double-digit scoring games. I mean, look, that season, the rest of the season, it, it was exciting, right? I mean, it was exciting. And obviously, he suffered that injury. And then, of course, there was the playoff debacle, I guess, with, you know, Lynn. There was a he said, she said, Jeremy Lynn saying that he, um, you know, didn't feel healthy enough to return, whatever, saying that he never felt more than 85% strong in, in his uh, left knee. And yeah, obviously that didn't exactly endear him to Knicks fans. But nonetheless, you know, there there was that chapter of insanity, right? What, what's, what actually took place where it was born you know, for the remainder of the regular season up until the point he got injured. But then there was the other part of the chapter. There was the other chapter, and I guess, which ultimately led, led to the conclusion. And that was the off season, Because if you remember, there was this, you know, peculiar clause, you know, as far as the Knicks not owning uh, Jeremy Lin's bird rights, right? So if they were going to sign him, it would have had to have been to a pretty sizable contract. So... You know, again, he was a restricted free agent, and you know, heading into that off season, you figured, all right, look, they're going to do what they need to do. But Jeremy Lin's going to be back. The story's too good, and obviously, he's carved himself a niche with this team. And you know, this is going to proceed going forward. And if you remember, in order to accommodate 
Lynn's eventual contractual number, they had to get a waiver on Steve Novak, right? Because Steve Novak, there was a funky clause in his contract about the Knicks not owning his bird rights. But then there was some judgment made by the NBA saying something to the effect of how that they would have it in spirit so they would be able to sign Steve Novak and they still have cap flexibility to sign Jeremy Lin. Then it got even more crazy because then it was, well, uh, Carmelo Anthony may or may not want him on the team. Jeremy Smith, uh, J.R. Smith, rather, popping off of the mouth saying that, well, you know, if he has that kind of a contract, I don't know how this is going to play in the locker room. And and there was all sorts of, you know, momentum starting to build where you're saying to yourself, "Uh uh-oh, like this this might not end well, or hey, don't ruin this for us. But, you know, sure enough, you know, history would play out with Jeremy Lin going to Houston, you know, negotiating a number, but then going back to Houston, and that's where it all fell apart, and that's where, you know, the Knicks made that trade for uh, for Raymond Felton, which essentially signaled the end, the official end of Lin Sanity. Now, whether or not you want to say that that was, you know, Carmelo or J.R. Smith pulling a power play, or whether you want to say that, you know, Dolan, you know, kind of had had enough as far as or he really didn't appreciate the fact that you know Lynn went back to Houston for more money uh and he took that really as a slap in the face because you, you, if you remember the reports you know Dolan basically put his arm around Jeremy Lynn and said look kid you're staying here I got big plans for you this is this is going to be great what we have here and we're just going to continue to build and build and build so it goes from that to again reportedly Dolan being so disgusted with Jeremy Lin going back for more money that he decided, all right, you know what, enough is enough. Made three for Felton, and we're just going, we're just going to go in that direction. But hey, look, from that point on, you know, the next year the Knicks would have arguably their best season in recent history. You know, winning fifty four games, going to the second round of the playoffs, and had things gone differently, they they could have seen him, themselves in the Eastern Conference Finals. So, you know, obviously, you know. I guess Raymond Felton was a part of that, but Jason Kidd was maybe the bigger part, even though he sort of ran out of gas down the stretch there. But nonetheless, you know, Jeremy Lin would go on and, you know, bounced around team to team to team, you know, showed himself to be a capable NBA scorer on most teams. You could say, you know, on a good team, maybe your fourth, you know, score, you know, on a mediocre team, maybe your third score. But nonetheless, he showed himself to be a, a capable NBA scorer, which is, a lot more than, you know, people would have thought with him coming out of Harvard undrafted and then, you know, having to really bounce around G League to NBA, G League to NBA and really establish a niche for himself. But look, as far as that electricity that we had for those 20-odd days, you know, it, it, it was something that I, I don't think you'll ever see something like that again. I mean, you never will. Because first of all, you know, you might get that with an undrafted player, you might get that with somebody who was called up from the G League, but you know, let's call it for what it is. I don't think you'll ever have a situation where, let's say, it's another Asian American, right? Because I mean, you remember how much you know, all of a sudden you know, now you're seeing visit Taiwan ads everywhere on MSG on the MSG network, and w- what kind of you know commerce it opened up, like it, literally a gateway to Asia for the New York Knicks for this market for the NBA. The business implications that Jeremy Lin opened up just by that 19-day stretch were just phenomenal. But, you know, you take it a step further, again, it was the ultimate underdog story. I mean, you know, look, I I am, I guess, uh, I'm South Asian, South Asian American, if you want to call it that. If there was another South Asian, you know, or, or a South Asian, rather, who made the same trek as Jeremy Lin, then, yeah, maybe you'll have another Lin Sanity or whatever his last name might be, plus Sanity. But... You know, with, with Jeremy Lin, I mean, it was crazy because that story transcended sports. I mean, there were business articles written. I remember specifically, you know, I mean, mind you, every publication, no matter what their background or whatever, wanted to capitalize upon the insanity craze, right? Um, you, you know, I remember specifically there was a business-related magazine, and they had a whole article about what insanity should teach you about how you should manage your, your, your workers and how you should try to find untapped potential in your employees, right? So, again, it's, we all love an underdog story. It's the reason why Rocky is one of the most celebrated movie, you know, uh, franchises of American history. We love the underdog story. Now, as far as Knicks fans are concerned, we wanted that underdog story 
to continue in New York, which obviously it didn't. Because yeah, I remember during Linsanity, it was to the point where I, also, you know, forget about just the fact that you and your friends would say, I want to watch Linsanity. Not, I want to watch the Knicks game tonight. It was, yo, Linsanity is on. Yo, we got to get home, watch Linsanity. You remember there was that contractual dispute between MSG, the MSG network, and uh, Cablevision. Or Optima, no, 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 Time Warner, Time Warner, that, that it went in, in uh, New York City. There was a contractual, contractual uh, dispute between Time Warner and the MSG network. Residents were so up in arms that they could not watch Jeremy Lin in Linsanity that, I mean, there was a near riot. And Time Warner and MSG Network were forced to come to the table and hash out a deal so that Time Warner, you know, users could watch Knicks games, could watch Linsanity, could experience Linsanity. It was to that level. I remember there was um, that story about how, you know, Jeremy Lin at the time, you know, was sleeping on Landry Fields' couch, right? I mean, he, again, keep in mind, he had he'd been... He bounced back and forth, um, you know, had not actually rented out a place. I mean, I think I think his brother lived in the city, so there were nights where he was staying with his brother, nights where he was staying with, with Landry Fields. And, you know, there were real estate brokers stepping up to the plate and offering Lynn, you know, free stay up until he could find a place. Why? Because, first of all, they all wanted to be part of the story. And second of all, they'd get their name, their company, and the headlines, and so on and so forth. I mean, I remember when, you know, Lynn finally decided on where to live, right? He, he, I remember, specifically rented an apartment in the W Hotel, I guess, in Times Square. And I, I didn't even know that you could do that. I just thought it was a hotel. But I remember even that was a story. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh, my God, look, yo, that's the, it's the W in Times Square. That's where Jeremy Lin lives. And so, it, I mean, there was a whole universe created out of that story. And, I mean, Mike D'Antoni, you know, known for being an offensive genius, you know, he really hitched his horse to that wagon. You know, he he as a coach was in a way reborn when Lynn became his point guard. I remember he would say in quotes how he, he was running, sprinting to practice. He was so excited to run these plays that he had, you know, drawn up, but with Jeremy Lynn running them. I mean, it was to that to that level. You know, and obviously, you know, I guess Lynn Sanity faded, um, Mike D'Antoni you know, eventually lost his job. And, you know, obviously a lot of the blame comes back to Carmelo Anthony, that Melo reportedly, or I guess per rumor, you know, couldn't stand the fact that Jeremy Lin had taken over that popularity that Melo wanted when he decided to come to New York. Um, so, again, we'll never really know the whole story between Melo and Lin's relationship or what went on behind the scenes that eventually led to Lynn shockingly no longer being part of the Knicks, despite that, you know, epic Cinderella Disney story. But nonetheless, today, February 4th, we are looking at seven years ago that Linsanity was born. What was your favorite Linsanity moment or favorite moments? Because I know for a Knicks fan, that 19 days brought about so many moments. You know, the one that I forgot against Toronto. Time winding down, and I was listening to the game on the radio. Brendan Brown, I remember, literally took over the call. You know, Brendan Brown's a color commentator. And, you know, I think it was, oh, my goodness. the I'm forgetting his name. Uh, uh, Spiro, Spiro Ditas. Spiro Ditas. Spiro Ditas is calling the play, saying, you know, Lane has the ball along the perimeter. And all of a sudden, Brendan Brown jumps in and was like, clear out, let Lane go one-on-one. This is his game. And, you know, sure enough, he pulls back, knocks down that three ball game in Toronto. And, I mean, you're sitting there just thinking to yourself, another chapter in this epic story that we cannot make any sense of. So, anyway, share your stories. What was your fa- What were your favorite moments from the Linsanity run? What did you feel when he eventually... You know, went to Houston when things didn't work out here in New York. And seven years later, what you think about when you reflect back on that Linsanity period.